This is our short overview of the most important upcoming cars. All the new highlights here in about 20 minutes. Let's go! It's time for the all-electric Porsche Taycan in the series production model. Finally, there is a competitor to the Tesla Model S by Porsche and also they're going more in a sustainable way. Exterior-wise, it looks pretty sleek, although it's not a small vehicle. It looks way, way smaller than the Panamera, just, you know, when seeing it live here in person although it's just slightly shorter. So I think design-wise a very interesting job. 4 meters 96, 16 foot 3 or 195 inches is the length of the Porsche Taycan. 680 horsepower is the power output for this vehicle. Acceleration figure to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour is about 3.2 seconds. And the estimated range WLTP cycle is 450 kilometers. That would be about 280 miles. And let me already give you the figures of the Taycan Turbo S, which we don't see at the moment. A little bit lower in the acceleration, 2.8 seconds even, so below this magic 3 second mark. 760 horsepower, but then a little bit less of the range, 410 kilometers, that's about 250 miles. An end. of course, even more expensive, 185k, that's the German list price then. This is the interior overview and we can see it's pretty clean, definitely here with those surfaces then here, this new screen here and well again one, two, three, four screens overall. This one, the passenger screen is really for the co-driver, that one is an option. Other than that the main setup is, let's start here, 16.8 inch curved display for the driver display, in the middle one the digital suite but this definitely all digital. You still have some decent interior space, yes, of course the package overall is not good. You don't have too many, too much uh, you know, luggage capacity and the rear is usable for tall adults, yes, but it won't win the price for the most practical car. Yes, it's more supposed to be a sports car and from the interior feeling something between a Panamera and a 911, at least to me. That's, you know, how to describe it you know, in the easiest way. Interior also pretty cool that they offer a vegan interior, so because it really fits when you build an electric vehicle that's supposed to be more sustainable, then you also have to be sustainable on the interior, that just makes sense. And of course it also has practical advantages like staying cooler in summer and also warmer in winter when you sit on those race tech seats. So would we'll look forward to test this version also very soon and present it to you. And again technology and Performance-wise, the figures we heard were very impressive. You can also compare them to the main competitor, yes. So pretty fast. How will it drive? We'll keep you updated with that. The all-new Land Rover Defender. Interesting, they kept a very iconic style also on the exterior. It's of course totally different from the outgoing model, yes. But it has an own distinctive style also if you compare other Land Rover or Range Rover models from the lineup. So I think it's a really interesting car and Maybe a new competitor to the Mercedes G-Class, for example. And the Jeep Wrangler is, of course, also a unique one. So, very rare and unique cars there on the market. The good thing is, because of this angular design on the exterior, we have a lot of space on the interior. The best package from all Land Rover cars. That's pretty cool, so you can use a lot of the space you have. Then there are also, for example, those new PHEV engines available if you want to go a little bit more sustainable. Sustainable materials, we have to see about that. Of course, abundance of cow leather use here on the display cars. The quality of the interior materials is sometimes very good. So I like those visible screws, those are cool elements, all those rugged elements. On the other hand, there are some parts which are, you know, not living up to the price of the car, which is extremely high, 50 to 90k, and that's of course my biggest criticism criticism point with the car. Yeah, the G-Class is also very expensive, but from, you know, this rather off-roadish car, I would also expect to be, you know, a little bit cheaper than a little bit more affordable. Interior overview here with this horizontal stress and a lot of cubby holes right there. The screen here is in demo mode, so we will see um, different stuff that can be displayed at the moment, actually. Then the steering wheel can be moved up and down electronically and also a little bit inward and outward again. All digital instruments. Off-road use will be also quite cool, so it will still be also among the most capable Land Rover vehicles. Also if you think about approaching engines and not only the five-door, especially about the three-door. So, a lot to discuss with this vehicle. Please join us there in the comments. I hope you enjoyed also this part here. The Volkswagen ID3. Will it be as iconic as the VW Beetle? as the VW Golf. 
We do not know yet. It definitely means a lot for the company. And I think this paradigm shift, you know, thinking about the CO2 neutral um, production, for example, being more environmentally friendly, being sustainable. This is also something that, you know, comes from the background. It also, in this case, has to come from top down. And this car is supposed to stand for that. Of course, we'll follow the development if they really stick true to their word, because that's also something which is very important to us here at Autogefühl. On the exterior, we definitely see some quotes of the VW Beetle, so it has some retro elements, also fitting to this new retro-style logo of VW, especially then with the short overhangs, the long wheelbase, the car appears bigger than the Golf visually, but it's actually the same length, as I said. And indeed, it is true that it has an interior space of a Passat, especially a lot of legroom there in the rear. Not exactly sure how comfortable it is because the rear bench is like falling so much back backward that it would be one criticism point in the interior. The software and the infotainment was not ready yet, so we cannot rate that. So we have to do that at a later stage, but we of course keep you updated on that. But the setup with the small screen, with the steering wheel that always moves together with the steering wheel actually makes sense. Nothing is blocking your view. There will be a head-up display available, as I said, also. And the screen of the central infotainment is also actually right-sized. Hardly any buttons left. Everything a very clean layout. So this already looks quite promising. And on the one hand, they can use existing stuff like, you know, beat door handles or the door closing sound which is like very solid in the Volkswagen Corporation. Of course on the other hand they have to work on new stuff which hasn't been there before. In the cutaway model where you can very well see again how it's placed in the lower end of the vehicle and here the rear wheel drive. This one is here is the electric motor. This is also the place where you can recharge the car. Talking about recharging at the moment, maximum 100 kilowatts DC. Later on, there will be 125 kilowatt DC charge available and AC charging up to 11 kilowatt. And then there are three battery sizes actually, 48 kilowatt hours, 55 or 77. So those three sizes available. And of course, the price differs and Volkswagen promises that the entry price for example, the German reference is below 30,000 euros than with the smallest battery. And if you pick like the mid-range ba uh, battery and some trim, and you might end up like 40,000, 40,000 plus something. Um, so yeah, it's something like a high trimmed Golf diesel that will be approximately the price region. And the ranges you can get from those batteries will vary about 330 to 550 kilometers. That's about 200 to 350 miles. The new Honda E, one of the most interesting vehicles from this motor show. Iconic exterior design. It's small, it's narrow, it's enough size-wise for the city and it's a good package. You still have enough space on the interior and a very thought-out concept. Great interior quality materials, the best we've seen from Honda ever. It's really something completely new. They thought that one through from scratch. A very modern interior also with those screens, maybe a little bit screen overkill, so I maybe could have reduced that a little bit just. But other than that, very clever interior concept and this will also drive very sporty because with a low center of gravity, 50-50 weight distribution. Yeah, the car is of course heavy as all electric vehicles because of the battery, but still it will surely drive very agile. Looking forward to the drive very soon. There's a button right there and then you press it and ta-da, there we have the charging possibilities. When you park in front of a charging station or something, AC in the top, and of course the lower one is the DC charger. And it's actually possible to charge up to 50 kilowatt hours, so pretty fast as for a DC charger, well, let's say fast enough for this small vehicle. Battery size is 35 kilowatt hours, and the range 220 kilometers or 140 miles. Also, the range is enough for the city. It's nothing for, you know, long range commuting or, you know, like, you know, when you drive like 50,000 kilometers a year or something. But for all other purposes, this one is really what modern car customers need, together with an iconic design. And I really think that this one will be one of the future EV bestsellers in this small segment. The Audi RS7 Sportback is probably, maybe we can agree on that, the sportiest Audi, just from the look. Exterior, I think we can all agree, such a beautiful vehicle. And even with those very sporty accentuations, with those, yeah, a little bit maybe too extreme exhaust, beauty tips on the outside, half fake, I would say, and those really large rims, 
it still looks somewhat elegant and that's no, no, not quite often with those top sporty models. I would probably take less black and more the, you know, the chrome elements, just my personal choice. The red is also pretty cool, but I would also take a Thomas Blue, of course, for this car. The interior has a very good build quality. The touchscreens and so on, they are actually quite easy to learn and everything is very nicely visualized. However, you can always argue if while driving a central control knob is a little bit more practical and safer to use. But voice control now gets better and better. Although Audi S for the voice input is not as up to the game with BMW and Mercedes yet. Probably they will change something for the future models there. They have to actually. Then the rear is uh, the rear and the inside is actually quite well to use still considering it's a coupe style car. But it fits still for tall people and the trunk actually quite astonishingly that for such a sporty vehicle you can easy load things in and out so that's a unique selling point here definitely for the seven models of audi here the rs model gets the four liter v8 bi turbo petrol engine 600 horsepower 800 newton meters of torque and the acceleration figures are 3.6 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour and 12 seconds to 200 kilometers or 125 miles per hour. That's of course pretty massive. Combined with the converter automatic gearbox, all-wheel drive setup is 40% front, 60% in rear, then a little bit adaptive. Can put a little bit more to the rear, but also a little bit more to the front, depending on the situation. But definitely you have a rear wheel bias. Driving-wise, we can expect, of course, a lot of performance. Really looking forward to drive this one if that really still masters sportiness and comfort. The S7 was a very cool ride. But of course, this diesel, 3-liter diesel power was, you know, somewhat good for everyday driving and a little bit lower, lower fuel consumption. This one then here, the true performance version. Let's see how that one plays out. What can they still do? I mean, they have a mild hybrid system and cylinder on demand, so cylinder deactivation technology. So that's something more towards sustainability. Will that drop the fuel consumption? Mm, I'm not exactly sure about that. We have to find out about that. Of course, on the interior, they need to use less animal skin. It's, you know, it's modern times and should be long to the past, the same as street lanterns are not powered by whale fat anymore. But learn, Audi is also learning. We've seen that with the newer concept models. Other than that, I think it's a really fantastic car. The all new BMW X6. Let's go. Why would you go for an X6 instead of an X5? It's all about the styling, definitely this falling coupe roofline. That's why those SUV coupes are being built. It is, of course, somewhat a compromise, but you can see you can live with a rear headroom. That's okay, also for tall people. And also the trunk area, of course, limit a little bit in height, but still, it's an overall very well usable car, even you know for our family, so that works. Here the M50i has a stronger stance on the road, but altogether this new generation of the X6 is already stronger than before and this illuminated front kidney, you should check it out in the other episode of the X6, is really very amazing and looks almost a little bit menacing in the front definitely. So a little bit stronger in the styling also in general if you compare it to the X5. The Audi A5 facelift S, S5 Coupe. The Sportback is of course more practical and the convertible, the cabriolet is of course, to me at least, always the most fun because it delivers you this open top experience. Which one is your favorite of the A5 model line? Coupe, Sportback or convertible? Please tell me in the comments. The facelift, yeah, some fresh up in the exterior. The S mods are a little bit more distinguishable now than to the other models. And especially for the interior with this new infotainment screen. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, the MMI control knob is gone. That might be a downside to some. Then again, you have a more sophisticated system, an easier software to control, and also pretty nice as for the big GPS you have there. So smartphone connectivity also has been improved and so on. So I think overall, you know, not too bad what they did there. And it's really nice that they have refreshed it now. Also some significant changes we've seen to the A4, 
So the same, of course, A4 and A5, they are both on the same, some would say, platform, share the technology, and that's why also the changes are somewhat similar. So now tune in to the A4 face reviews, for example, and soon we will have also updated driving reviews here with the A5 facelift. What will be the future Mercedes S-Class, their top-of-the-line, top-of-luxury car? Well, it will be all electric and will maybe be this EQS concept, their next all-electric vehicle, here as a preview for you here on Autogofuel. Let's talk about exterior details and also a little bit about the futuristic interior. Let's go. the Mercedes GLE Coupe in this new generation, like this or also as the AMG 53. Now, like the second generations of those SUV Coupes, I think are a little bit more likable. They're a little bit sleeker from design. The designers really try to improve this line. And yeah, of course, the SUV versions always make more sense if you think about, you know, practicability. But then again, an SUV Coupe, as for the practicability, still makes more sense as the sedan version, for example, of a, of a vehicle that would be the same length. So we've seen also in the trunk that you can still very well use that one. Yeah, so I think it's just up to you and let's say, you know, traffic size or consumption wise, it doesn't really matter if you take the SUV or the coupe. As I like to transport some bicycles also in the rear, I would still go with the SUV. What about you? Would you take this one here, the GLE, also as a coupe? Here, of course, it also depends on driving because of the shorter wheelbase. Will it be that more agile than the SUV? Of course, we will find out here on Autogefühl in our driving review, which will come at the, up at the later stage. Or if you watch this video at the later stage, after the premiere, maybe the driving review is already online, then it's always worth to browse our channel or use the YouTube search, Autogefühl, Mercedes, GLE, for example, then you'll find all the content. So exterior-wise, pretty strong in the front, definitely. This line, a little bit more, uh, more elegant than before, and also stronger stance overall. Then in the interior, this new infotainment system, this is definitely the highlight. Also, step-up build quality, if you think about the predecessor generation. This is the Mercedes GLB S 35 AMG. Yeah, not 53. That would be probably a little bit too strong for this car. <laughs> well, but what's your take on that? A performance version of this family SUV, you could say why not, why not having fun and still offering a lot of flexibility because the ratio of exterior space and then what space you have on the interior is really good and therefore I also really like this vehicle. Yeah, it's not my favorite as for design from the side, but I really like in the front and also in the rear, just the side profile, especially in the AMG version. I don't know, maybe it will grow on me, but so far first look, I'm not too excited about it. But driving-wise, it will probably be scoring quite well. It has a longer wheelbase than normal A-Class, yes. But then again, it's still not such a long car. It's also pretty light, so this can actually qu work quite well. Also performance-wise, we're looking forward to test that one. The interior is really a great thing. It has a good build quality. They have great animal skin alternatives, which are really high class. So, and even seven-seater option in an AMG vehicle. I haven't seen that yet. Now it's there. What do you think, guys? This is a first review of the Ford Puma. Well, this new edition of that one, I mean, why not make it a little bit more cross crossover-ish, SUV-ish? That's the contemporary trend. And, you know, why not doing it in that way? Definitely looks stylish and emotional from the exterior. Interior, I really like the titanium X trim here today with those bright fabric seats, which also can be bought then with those removable seat covers. So that was pretty cool. Other than that, the interior is somewhat a weak part of this car. You don't have too much space, but then also it's, it's a small car. And of course, those fabrics are very, pretty cool at the inside of the doors. But then there are also some weak parts we found there, like with those rubber claddings and so on. 
interesting also with the trunk with his new mega box so i mean not sure what i would use it actually for but it's a definitely very interesting approach I'd like to know what do you think about the new ford puma here you like it here when it's a little bit crossover suv -ish? if you of course can remember the old puma as a comparison so thanks for tuning into that one here and also tune in to our next episodes